First, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to comment. It's a real honor and privilege, uh, especially after such an impressive event. Um, every talk has been really just incredibly illuminating, thought-provoking. For me in particular, I spend most of my time thinking completely at the opposite end of the spectrum in terms of research. I think mostly about early phase clinical trials, which are the least cluster-like of any realm of uh, of research, and so for me, this is really quite a, quite an alien terrain, but really quite interesting in terms of thinking through some of the uh, conceptual uh, overlaps. What I want to do um, after disclosing that proviso about my limited expertise here is to try to think a little bit outside the box about some of the issues that are encountered in the context of cluster trials and to think about what it might mean for the role of gatekeepers and questions that I think are sort of a little bit flapping in the wind of the analysis that, uh, that uh, at least I've read in, in, in the paper. So let me go through these. First of all, there's an issue of incentives. Uh, in most realms of clinical research, these are conducted at academic medical centers. Part of the whole enterprise of academic medical centers is the production of evidence. It strikes me that in the context of a lot of cluster trials, these are being conducted in settings that do not have knowledge production as one of their priority goals. And so there's a really important question of how one incentivizes the kind of behavior and conduct in a non-research setting. And that obviously has many implications for the validity of a study, its ability to meet its objectives, its powering, et cetera, et cetera. Clearly, gatekeepers are a critical role uh, in terms of correcting or aligning uh, that absence of incentives. And to me, that raises some interesting questions about what the proper relationship is between research teams and gatekeepers. In the very first talk, someone raised the question about indu induction, inducements uh, of, of gatekeepers or inducements of uh, research subjects. Given that incentives are not part of, they're, they're not incentivized to do research, how does one properly get institutions and organizations to align their, uh, their orientation in a way that is, uh, is uh, sufficient enough and sustained enough to produce the kind of uh, evidence uh, one, one needs. Second issue I want to think a little bit about is the issue of transaction costs. So uh, when we consent a patient, uh, when uh, researchers uh, consent a patient, I'm not, I'm not supposed to use that as a, as a, as a transitive verb, I guess. Um, there's some cost of the actual, you know, going through the informed consent, and it's these transaction costs that lead us to worry sometimes about whether consent is so cumbersome that it's uh, perhaps in some circumstances we might want to waive it. It strikes me that in the context of, tr of these cluster studies, you have very, very high transaction costs for consenting a cluster. Um, it's very expensive to, I, I would gather, uh, although you can tell me if I'm wrong, to accrue uh, a site, uh, to earn their trust, uh, to go through the plan with them, sufficient so that they conf they're confident to hand over the people in their charge, say, for data collection or for interventions. And that, to me, raises some interesting questions also about the obligations and duties of gatekeepers vis-a-vis -vis the researchers. We don't normally think of subjects as having obligations to researchers, but here, Something that's not addressed in the paper, I think, and how much can a, paper, a single paper on the subject address? There's lots more to do, a renewal of a grant, perhaps. Um, but here's, a, here's an important question. Uh, early on, someone made the, uh, uh, described the problem when clusters withdraw consent. Given how tenuous powering is in these cluster studies and how costly it is to accrue sites, the withdrawal of a single center can uh, frustrate the powering uh, and thus, the sacrifice uh, uh, or the burdens that other clusters have endured for the production of that knowledge. And so that raises questions about whether gatekeepers, once they have actually enrolled their site, have in some way an obligation to maintain their enrollment in some way uh, by virtue of not uh, compromising the commitments that other clusters have made uh, to a research program. Third issue. Um, Well, let me skip the third and just in, in terms of getting on with time. Uh, uh, another issue I want to mention really quickly here is the issue of 
the difference between uh, in, in regular research, non-cluster versus cluster, it strikes me that in cluster studies, the idea here is, I think, to intervene in a system. There are many, many different actors in a system. Uh, you poke it here, and it has effects all over the place. And uh, many of the talks have been trying to clarify which points in that system matter morally, who protects what, uh, you know, what nodes within that system are, you know, do we not have to really worry about protecting, et cetera, et cetera. But this sort of strikes me as a sort of a, you know, as a, as a, as a concern or a problem with, uh, and I, I sort of raised this early on with the um, discussion about the impacts on populations uh, that are not human subjects. Uh, but, you know, you poke the system, you get the healthcare practitioners to apply an intervention, it presumably impacts the interests in some way of many, many different actors in the system. Uh, and one somehow has to incorporate that into uh, the moral calculus uh, of that study. Um, and the question is, if the IRBs, for example, are not responsible for protecting those non-subjects, uh, and you don't have fiduciary relationships, uh, then who is protecting the other recipients of, you know, of the impact of the intervention within that system? Now, I want to close by asking one, one last, uh, one last uh, uh, issue that I think is a, is a bit of a contrast here. Um, in a lot of clinical research, uh, at least in drug development, uh, we have regulation, uh, namely the FDA uh, or Health Canada. And that acts as a very powerful check on the kind of information that's produced in studies. It's a, uh, we, of course, there's limitations with FDA review, et cetera, but uh, however imperfect that is, it's an important check on the quality of the research. In contrast, in a lot of cluster studies, I take it that these are not regulated in the conventional sense. There is no sort of uh, government entity necessarily uh, that is acting as a quality check on the quality uh, of the uh, design of a study and the implementation. That means that the burden of maintaining that quality f falls entirely on the shoulders of the investigator team as well as on the REB team. But I wonder also whether gatekeepers in some way have some role or responsibility in terms of assuring um, not merely that the resources expended by the institution are well expended and are well put in terms of uh, supporting the research, but also in terms of reconciling the overarching uh, objectives uh, of the institution or whatever the cluster is with, uh, in some sense, uh, the, the goals of the research. And so I want to close by just mentioning a thought experiment. I think it's useful to sort of think through these frameworks and to sort of come up with some sort of challenging scenarios that might sort of you know, compel us to sort of revise or rethink or adjust or some of the frameworks that, uh, that we propose. So here's my scenario. Imagine you're a pharmaceutical company and you want to develop a more effective intervention for getting clinicians to switch their prescriptions to your drug, drug A. Now you know drug A, it's very well established that drug A has comparable safety uh, and risk profile to drug B. So the issue of equipoise is not really a major issue. Uh, perhaps the REB has reviewed the protocol and made a decision that uh, the pharmaceutical company's drug really does have a comparable risk-benefit profile. So arguably, the institutional interests are not necessarily put in harm's way by a hospital deciding they are going to allow their practitioners to be randomized to uh, a detailing intervention and a non-detailing intervention. But I would argue that probably academic medical centers would want to think twice, even if there is a net gain to that institution in terms of revenue production, say, for them, that they might want to think twice about allocating their resources accordingly. And it seems to me that this, you know, scenarios like this sort of raise questions about, um, I guess, how gatekeepers should orient them themselves uh, with respect to the research objectives. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs>